So the aim of the session was to um, try and um, both look at how we captured some of the physical properties or physical insights that we, 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 we found or we, we discovered from studying the, 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 new, the new fibers, new amplifiers, um, uh, the propagation characteristics of nonlinear channels, in how could we translate them into to the benefit of future optical networking. There's one talk from both from each program, from Unlock and from um, Hyper Highway, and then an external talk giving us the vision from, uh, from Microsoft. So we start with Seth Savory, who is with, who is with Unlock, um, and now we are going to move from UCL to Cambridge. So. Thank you very much, Lena. So um, I'm going to sort of summarize some of the networking work that we've done within the context of Unlock. And it's done by myself, uh, Alex Alvarado, Lena, and uh, David Ives. And we're really going to be looking at um, optical networking in non linear region. <laughs> so the key thing is this is sort of a rough outline of a US core network going from California, this side, across to uh, New Jersey, this side, just to give you an idea of the kind of networks we might look at. The problem is it's a multi user environment. So we're going to route using a wavelength state to go from California across to New York. Um, but we also might route um, through the, the Midwest to the same point. So we've got a choice of ways we can go there. Um, but we also might have terms going from paths going from Washington State through to New Jersey, uh, but again passing through Central America, Central America, um, as well as just the transit path there. And the key thing there is we have um, a single fiber. So this fiber here can actually end up with a lot of multiple users. Um, and they're all being rooted in the optical domain, and so the fiber nonlinearity is causing the wavelengths to interact. Now we've got good models for nonlinearity, so these are, these are just some experimental uh, measurements, uh, and it's go going from uh, 100 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers. Uh, kilometers. Um, and these are measured points, and this is just a, a fit based on uh, a theoretical model, the EGM model. And as you can see, you've got three parameter models fitting 110, uh, 210 experiment points very well. So I think from that point of view, from the network point of view, we've got a reasonable model we can use. Um, what we're going to need to use is a very simplified model for um, network emulation, because we do lots of Monte Carlos. So if we look at um, a network like the one I was looking at a moment ago, we might end up simulating a total transmission distance of um, 10 to 12 kilometers because we'll be doing the network again and again and again and again to try and build up the network statistics. So the kind of model we look at is very similar to the one that uh, has been reported before. So we're looking at a, a signal-to-noise ratio and we're combining that as some parts coming from the transceiver, the parts coming from the uh, optical amplifiers, which is adding in noise. We've got a, a an SPM term coming from the, the channel affecting itself, and the key thing here is it doesn't necessarily act scale purely linearly with distance, and then we've also got some XPM terms, uh, which do scale with linear, with linearly with distance um, because they add incoherently. So we're going to look at a very simple mod network model. So we've just got the simplest network that we can have, which is what um, some source here, uh, destination here, and at this point here we can add in channels and we've got channels. So it's really just to give you an insight as to what's going on when we talk about um, networking in non-linear routine. So this is what happens. So if we put in constant power for all those channels, um, then we end up with the ones that aren't going as far having a much higher SNR compared to the ones that are not going as far. Um, and this, this shape here is because of nonlinearity. That's what's causing a variation here. Because we're getting um, a different amount of walk on due to um, the dispersion. And that's obviously not ideal from a, a system perspective. So, what we can say is well, why don't we just split up into two bands and have um, the ones that are going a further distance having a higher power and the ones that are going a shorter distance a lower power. Uh, and then we end up with this kind of um, profile. So, we've got a a variation now, and now they're a bit more clustered, so we're keeping the SNR closer together. And then we say, well, why don't we try and profile the, the, the powers again? And we can then level out the sig signal SNR 
by adjusting all those power levels to read from all those channels separately. And we can actually do better again because we can then say, why don't we redistribute those, those channels? So we've got a, this is a, a, a far away channel, near channel, far, near, and we've interspersed those. And what that then means is we've got um, maximum separation between each one of those channels of high power. So we've actually got there, say, a 100 gigahertz gap, not than just 50 gigahertz gap. And then you see we increase the, um, the signal SNR. And now all of that can be translated into capacity. So in terms of the challenges of a core network, we've got to look at it when we're routing that the light path needs to be continuous across the network. We need to find a route with continuous spectrum. Um, so we're assuming it's not going to get um, changes way down through, its, through the network. We need to find the route through the network now defines the um, signal noise ratio in conjunction with the launch power we choose. Um, but that signal noise ratio, if we think what we were having in the talks this morning, then define what bandwidth we require to transmit that data. Um, so in general, we've got quite a complex um, problem with everything is interacting with everything else, um, and it's generally an NP um, complete problem. What we tend to do in our studies is consider three topologies. Um, so we've got an NSM net um, topology, which is a North American topology. Um, one which is a Deutsch Telecom topology, which is a small scale network, and then we've got a very large scale network, which is a Google um, network. And in terms of the key characteristics there, so the, the longest path in the Google one is 32 megameters, so that's a significant distance given that the um, diameter of the Earth is about um, 40 megameters, so that's going more than halfway around the world. Um, whereas these, these are the much smaller scale, because it's just covering um, Germany. You can see in all cases that the average node degree is pretty similar. <coughs> so what we can do is we can say, well let's look at that um, network quality and, and just try and see how well we can do. Fix the distance, um, fix our modulation format to QPSK because that's what we need given this distance. Uh, and what we see there is we get um, just over 100 terabits per second. I'll come more on to what I mean by that through the data. With a margin of about 1.6 dB. Now, people who are coming from the commercial side will say 1.6 dB is a little bit less than you'd like to practice. But it turns out we can actually adjust that and get that margin up to 3.3 by re-optimizing powers. So what we're doing here is we're taking each one of the powers for each one of the channels and re-optimizing it to increase the margin. So there's huge dimensionality we've now got this problem where because we're in the nonlinear regime, we can do these tricks and improve the, the margin. Um, it's something we'd never normally consider have done doing before. When we're in the linear regime, there's no benefit. But because we're in the nonlinear regime, we can do these things and actually improve the performance without actually um, sacrificing anything else. The only overhead is in um, management. Um, and in terms of how that relates to the network, well, this is what happens when we first start off by using the QGSK. Uh, so the, this link here and this link here are at capacity, but most of the network is not really at capacity, so it's very underutilized. Uh, and then as we go to say, let's use um, a level of QAM, so a higher level of modulation format, you can start to see more of the network start to go red, and we get a 17% increase in throughput. Um, and then we can adapt both the um, QAM and the power and everything else, we can get a 50% increase in throughput. And now what you're starting to see here is, um, as we push the networks towards their maximum throughput, we better distribute the load across the network. And that, that really is, is how we want to get a network. We want to get it so that everything is being pushed to its limit, rather than just having a single print point in the network that's suddenly causing the network to fail. Um, so in terms of adapting the power, so let's look at those three um, networks. So this is our Deutsche Telekom network, and you can see by Adapting the modulation to more format and power, we get a reasonable improvement in, in capacity. Um, not huge, but um, it's worth having. When we go to our slightly larger scale continental network, again we're seeing uh, maybe 50% or so improvement in capacity um, by just doing something clever with the transceivers and how we route it through the network uh, and adapt the power given that it's a non-linear channel. And then finally, when we go to the Google network, 
given its distance, it typically needs BPSK to go that far. But if we are a bit more astute in terms of what population wants for you, we suddenly see a significant benefit there. So it's almost a five-fold increase in capacity. Um, so it's actually in a modulation format of power, obviously useful improvement. But really, what's the limit? So what we really need to say is, well, what is network capacity or throughput? Now, it's not uncommon for papers to talk about um, increasing optical network capacity without even defining what network capacity is. Um, so what we need is a metric that can be maximized, which somehow represents the total data that can be transported. Um, and it relates um, both to the total data transported and given a particular traffic profile. So what we're going to go through, this is just some formality. So we've got a traffic matrix uh, which defines how um, data is going from one node to another node and the proportion of that. Um, and we're going to normalize that and we can then have a capacity between two nodes, a source and a, and, a, and a destination based on various routes through that, that network. Um, and then what we're basically then saying is our throughput, we can scale up that um, traffic matrix and say, make that um, traffic matrix as big as you can by this multiplier until it hits the limit, and that's our capacity, and that's how we're defining it. So it's more obvious what's going on when we look at some simple examples. So we're going to look at a three node topology. Um, so we've got just um, a 240 kilometer um, set of fiber pairs, and we're going to look at T1 being the portion of traffic going between uh, nodes A and B, and T2 being the portion of traffic going from here to here. What that also means is that uh, 1 minus T1 and minus T2 is the portion of traffic going between here and here, because they all have to add up to 1. And so we can actually write down a closed form traffic um, <coughs> matrix, just in terms of two parameters. And that, this is a sort of logical topology. Um, this is easier now to see what's going on pictorially. So this is showing the throughput of a network as we vary those parameters T1 and T2. So down here, all the traffic is going from A to C. None of it starts or ends in B. And we can get our total throughput there. This is going to be the amount of data going this direction and the amount of data going this direction. Equally, we can consider an example here where no data goes to to C. It's all between A and B. We can get a capacity for that. Um, and in this case, our maximum throughput is when we say that there's um, equal amounts of data going between each one of the nodes. So it's a symmetric case. <coughs> we can do something very similar with a ring network. Um, in this case, we, we're looking at the case where all the data goes from A to B. Um, some of it goes via C. Uh, in that case, you could end up with a capacity just under 200 terabits per second. But if you make it symmetric again, so all the traffic to go equally, we end up with about a 300 terabits per second capacity. So that's sort of trying to give you a, a, an overview in terms of the tools we're using to analyze networks. Um, now, what we're going to end up doing, having said that, is we're going to then assume the traffic is uniform. And the reason for that is dimensionality. If you think of our uh, NSF net, uh, we've got maybe 80 spectral slices, so we're up to 1,600 or more spectral slices which we've got to manage and coordinate. Um, if we then add in the dimensionality we need to have a completely arbitrary traffic matrix, that's another nice dimension of space. So we, we typically are going to just restrict this to just being uniform traffic for the um, ease of analysis at this stage. Um, so we end up with a very simple traffic matrix, uh, and that gives us a nice and easy form from our uh, throughput. So what we're going to look at now is this network here. So this is our Z-tag network again, and what we're going to exploit is there's a variation in SNRs. So it's going from just over 15 here up to uh, just over 25. And by varying the modulation format across that, we can actually um, improve the throughput. So in this case, you get a throughput of the order of 500 terabits per second. Um, again, we can do the same with the SF net, and we can get of the order of 300 terabits per second. Uh, and finally, with the um, Google global network, we get of the order of 100 terabits per second. And this is the real thing we start to do in the net, exploit these variations in an SNR to try and maximize the overall capacity of the network. <coughs> so 
what we want to use is cram often with some kind of error correction code. So the very first thing works, for example, is looking at just assume a hard decision code. And so we've got our different modulation formats on here. We all start to know the code very well. And so we'll go from, say, UTSK right up to, say, 512 QAM. And that varies amount of modulation formats we have. And we, what we'll do is we'll switch between modulation formats as the SNR increases. Uh, and this is the kind of curve you might see. In general, the, the odd um, values of QAM, so the, the 2 to the odd number, tend to form worse because of things like break coding. It tends to be better off going for the even powers. Uh, so this is a, a plot that's saying this is the optimal modulation format for each one of those SNRs. Um, and you can see there's a gap of, between Shannon and what we can, might achieve with a, an ideal hard system code. But as we go to a soft system code, well, we get that, that gap closes, which is obviously why we use soft system codes. Um, in terms of the network, then, we can then see what happens. So this is our ideal Shannon capacity <coughs> we talked about earlier. And then as we put in soft decision uh, forward error correction, it drops down, and then dropping down yet further when we put hard decision and uh, FEC in. And typically, we're dropping between 20 to 30 percent of our capacity because we're going to be using hard decision codes with plan. This is an area that sort of needs the transceiver side to say, okay, well, what can you do um, at that point to try and bring up the capacity because the network can probably use that capacity. Um, so far, what we've done is we've considered um, green field sites, which really considers about optimizing everything. Um, but in practice, the network generally evolves. So what we tend to do is look at now is a sort of Monte Carlo technique, which loads the network until a root can't be found. Um, so this is some results from the NSF net. And what we're doing here is we're, we're doing maybe 10,000 runs of the network and then seeing when, when does the blocking occur. And it obviously varies um, statistically. Um, so the dots are um, the experiment, well, the simulation points, and then the, the lines are fit. Um, so if we want to estimate, say, a blocking probability of 1%, which is about here, uh, we might need to do these 10,000 um, runs, which is sort of an overnight run, typically for an SF type network. Um, but as soon as it's uh, very well behaved by this line, which is actually in the screen value statistics approach, we turned out we can actually really reduce down the uh, Monte Carlo size. So these, you can roughly see, we've got um, the plus signs are uh, when we just did 100 runs and using this extreme value statistic approach, and the multiply signs, which almost lie on top of when we've done 10,000 runs. So, so by doing uh, a factor of 100 more runs, we're actually not getting significantly more uh, benefit in terms of performance, getting a very good initial guess from what's going on initially. So this is quite good because we're able to extrapolate from the network very early on in terms of what's going to be causing problems. So the ongoing um, research is trying to link this sort of sequentially loaded approach with um, the classic approach which we've used, which is sort of the um, mixed interval in, in the programming. Okay, so what we want to do is calculate the capacity. So um, due to the nonlinearities, what we said is many of the nonlinear networking parameters such as routine, modulation, and spectrum allocation are coupled. Um, the root diff and the power defines the variable SNR, which in turn defines the minimum spectrum required. And we have over adapting both the modulation format and the forward error co co correction accordingly. And the problem we're seeing at the moment is um, the current approach we've done, which, which um, applies to the whole network, is based on a mixed industry linear programming. And typically it doesn't scale very well once you go beyond maybe 15 nodes. If the the solver fails to converge, and that's even with uniform traffic. If we try and go to non-uniform traffic, it really struggles. Um, so what we're starting to look at is doing a sequentially loaded approach, which does scale to much larger networks, but we then need to be able to link the two results together. Um, and what's attractive there is a sequentially loaded approach. We can really formulate that as a game. Um, it, the objective being to load the network as high as possible. So we can start applying techniques from things like machine learning to be very disruptive here in trying to estimate what the capacity of a network could be. Um, so in terms of some of the res open research problems, um, first we really need to think about what is meant by a physical network. Um, so in computer science here we'll talk about topology. In, a, in a, an optical network, we don't really have a topology because a topology is something that's invariant to scale. If you squeeze it, it's the same thing. 
Whereas in an optical network, that's not true. If we make it smaller, the SNRs will change, uh, and suddenly diff different um, scenarios arise. Um, but we can learn something from a fixed network and stretching it. There's a post that Dave Lyles will be given later that's uh, dealing with that. Um, what we don't even know is, um, given a non-uniform current profile, and given a certain optical fiber connectivity, what's the ultimate throughput? So if I have a, a certain set of fibers linking certain um, set of cities, and they have certain demand, what is that throughput? We don't know that at all. I mean, you've seen um, how far the stuff on the single channel modeling has come along, but at the network scale, it's another degree of com complexity again. Uh, but what we really would like to know is, um, given we have a non-uniform traffic profile, um, we know where the nodes are, what's the optimal network configuration? Uh, both in terms of um, fiber, where should we put the fiber, how should we architect it, and things like this. Um, and it might be in terms of cost of deployment, but it more likely, uh, ultimately, is making a more resilient network. So uh, we're not putting in protection, just a one plus one protection. We're actually thinking about it from a network perspective to try and improve its overall performance. Uh, and then really it's then saying, well, how can data and machine learning combined with the knowledge of the underlying physics really improve network design? Okay, so that's really all I wanted to say. So um, thank you for listening and questions. something for every single, some minimum for every single mode, because some can be large, but you can sacrifice some mode, and we should suffer from low throughput. Is it some, no link? some link between... Those so it should try and capture that. So it should, it should look across all the possible links. Yes. And, and, and what I'm trying to say, it should be some minimal sort of uh, throughput for each mode, right? Um, well, it depends on how it's connected, of course. That's the issue, because if it can route another way through the network, then, then it should be able to do that to reduce the load. If we say, for example, latency is not our prime concern, um, and let's be honest, the speed of light is not fast enough in most cases, so um, latency does come from the fiber in general, um, we can let it route other ways around the network. Um, and so then we have to look at all those combinations together to try and work out what the overall throughput is. Oh, um, uh, the uh, for they, they put in an inverse square law on the uh, link capacity of the light. We, we have looked at that as well. Uh, <coughs> That's a relatively simple thing to do. No, no, we, we, we've looked at that. We've looked at um, both the inverse square. It typically might make um, maybe 50% adjustment in terms of capacity, according to whether or not it's an inverse square gravity model. Um, also, you've got models where you look at um, population densities. Yeah. Um, but I guess what we need to think about is um, there's going to be caching in the network eventually. How do we get that caching to link in with that network model? Okay, there's a question in the back, yes. So can I ask more of a practical question rather than academic? Speak up a little bit. Yeah, sure. More of a practical question rather than academic. You mentioned DTAG there, now obviously I know Deutsche Telekom quite well. Are you actually sharing all this information with them? Are you working with them? Is it, or is this in isolation? Um, we tend to work more with um, like the, um, British Telecom. Um, Deutsche Telecom's got a, a, a network which we can analyze. Okay. It's probably the best way of looking at it. And BT have a network which we, we use as sort of a 20, 2022 node network. But even that really struggles with an IOP <coughs> solution if you want to go to non-uniform traffic. Um, so, you know, obviously we know people in, in DTAG we can talk to, but at the moment it's just, it's an, it's a, um, an example of a network we're using it as well as anything else. And Deutsche Telekom is one of the partners in Unlock as a yeah. BT um, and as a BBC, so there are plenty of um, users. I think the one thing I would say that's really surprising is when we first suggested this idea of using individual, uh, adapting every single power for every single transceiver, yeah. we thought it was crazy. Um, but it's now, it seems, that that's the kind of thing people are actually looking at in practice in industry. Well, that was part of the question. How the operation I spoke well, no, that's the interesting. So, if you look at what um, Sienna pronounced with their liquid spectrum, that is adapting the power, the power of each individual wavelength separately. Got it. Thank you. 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 Thank
Can you consider grooming in your analysis? Grooming. Grooming, yeah. Grooming. Yeah, yeah, no, you can definitely um, put grooming in there. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's early work at this stage, you know, it's trying to understand what the, the pertinent issues are. Um, and there's lots of things we can put in there, uh, and grooming is just one of the others. And I think that that's really the focus of, of kind of the future, trying to um, trying to to translate some of what we understand about the physics the, the physics of the channel into optimally designing designing the networks. Somebody else had a question. Um, um, you yeah, yeah, Ben. So when you, you consider this the transceiver, do you also consider the gain equalization that you'd have to do, because these are multi-span systems, or you assume at the moment that the amplifiers are kind of ideal for the gain point of view? At the moment, it's, it's um, flat, yeah, it's an ideal amplifier. Again, these are things that we've put in, and I think ultimately what you'll have is you'll have a very intelligent um, software control network, which will be able to deal with these um, real issues, because it will take the metrology of the network and be able to feed that back to his physical understanding of what's going on and adapt itself. Okay, um, one more? Yeah, yeah. Um, question for how fast could it be if you have some restoration, production restoration, or how could you compute or manage all this? I, th I think what I would, I would anticipate is that um, the network would already know what to do in the event of the network um, failure. It, it should be able to um, play several moves like ahead like what a chess player would do and say in the event that goes down I know what class wants to do. I don't have to do the thought process. I've already worked out exactly what needs to get adjusted in the event of a failure. So I, I, I think it's as fast as it could operate. I mean that, that's, that's where networks should go, isn't that really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On that note, we go thank thanks very much and very much.